Good morning, fellow fishermen. Uh, Russell Gahagan here from The Real Shot Sheboygan. Uh, also, my Facebook and YouTube pages, um, Russell's Fish and Tech. If you haven't got over to my YouTube channel yet, uh, make sure you subscribe to that. I've got a lot of great videos on there, how-tos, fishing reports, uh, all kinds of good stuff. So get over to Russell's Fishing Tech uh, YouTube channel and subscribe so you get updates on when that happens. wanted to do something a little bit different here and uh, do a little Q&A um, and take some questions. Uh, here at the store every day I get guys that come in and ask questions, which is awesome. Um, but also I get a lot of messages on the internet, probably 20 to 30 a day. Um, and one of my Facebook pages uh, or my personal uh, you know, messenger, guys will ask a, a question. And, and that's totally fine. Uh, you guys are welcome to do that. Keep those coming. Uh, I'll get to them as fast as I can. Do my best to, uh, to answer them all. But the downside to those is other people who probably have those questions uh, don't have a platform to see my answers. So um, that's why I thought I'd do a little Q&A here. I've selected a, a series of questions. I want to keep this uh, rolling, keep it uh, somewhat of a reasonable time video. Um, so if I don't select yours this time, I do apologize. Feel free to send me that question if you want, and I'll answer it personally. Uh, but I think I'm going to answer quite a few of them here, and, and some of them are similar. So um, hopefully we'll get to a bunch of the different stuff. So we'll get started with Scott Walkner asks, what is the best temp to target for kings? Scott, that's a, that's a great question, but it's also a loaded question. Um, and what I mean by that is there's, there's some depends parts on there. Uh, depends on what time of year. Um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, early in the year, uh, like around the Salmon Cup time, the Sheboygan Salmon Cup tournament, early in June, uh, when we're first starting to really target kings, uh, we're looking for the warmest water we can find for the most part. Um, those kings are coming out from deep water. They're coming out from wintering. They're generally looking for a little bit warmer water that they can, they can feed in. So uh, for that tournament, we had a lot of really, really cold water, a lot of 40s, low 40s, 41, 42. You know, we even saw some 38, 39 when we dropped a downrigger down past 70, 80 feet down. Um, so we were looking for 44, 45, 46 degree water. And the only place we could find that was straight out a little bit south of Sheboygan um, in basically 80 to 130 feet of water down 30 foot. And, and that's really where we caught most of our fish, 20 to 30 down uh, in that general area. Now, uh, right now here in the first week of August, the water temps are in the mid 60s on the surface and down 40 foot, we got 48 degrees. Now we're again looking for 44, 46 uh, degree water temps, and those are down 50, 60 feet down uh, in 120, 140, 160 feet of water. So um, I would say 44 to 48 is kind of my, um, my favorite water temps to uh, sort of target kings, but there's a big but. Uh, we're coming up on a time here where uh, we're going to start dealing with spawning salmon. Um, and that's a whole nother animal. Uh, anytime after August 1st, you're sort of dealing with a different animal when you start talking mature kings. Uh, they're changing colors. I call it, they're getting their tuxedo on. They're getting ready to go to the dance at the harbor. And those fish will a lot of times lay in water that they won't lay in any other time in their life cycle. Uh, they may lay in 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 foot of water, even if it's extremely warm in there uh, from top to bottom. So uh, what happens then is they feed for very small windows throughout the day, uh, very, very short windows, but they are in there. And a lot of times it's the biggest fish that are in there in that inside water in that mid upper 50s, even 60 degree water stuff. So that does play a little bit of a role. Keep that in mind when you're trying to target salmon after August 1st. Uh, Joe Wirtz asks a great question. How often do you change baits when there isn't anything happening? Joe, that's an awesome question. Um, and I would say that there's two factors I look at when I'm thinking about changing baits. The factors I'm looking at is, number one, uh, have I verified or feel like my speed is correct? If I've checked that off the list, um, that's really important. Number two, is anybody catching fish around me? That's really the most important thing. Um, and here's why. I'm not a big believer in switching out tons of baits. I don't uh, go out there and switch out 20 or 30 baits in a trip. If I'm going to run nine lines, I'm going to probably put my best nine baits out to start or the ones I think give me the best chance. And I may only switch out three or four of those throughout the day. Now, I may switch out those three or four or three times, 
but I may only switch out three or four. I'm going to leave my best four or five on no matter what. Because I feel like if the fish are biting uh, where I am, those baits are going to catch fish. They give me my best chance. Um, but the factor that really plays a role for me is if people are catching fish around me, I'm going to start cycling through baits. Uh, but if I'm marking fish or I know I'm on fish, but nobody's really catching them, I'm going to assume that the fish aren't biting. And I'm probably not going to switch any baits or very few because when they do decide to bite, I want to have my best stuff on. So that's the way I look at that, Joe. Good question. Appreciate it. Um, Scott Walkner again. How do you go about locating fish when you can only fish weekends and how do you get good intel you can trust? Great, great question. I talk about um, networking a lot in my seminars that I give in the off season. Networking is incredibly important. And everybody's getting much better at that. With the internet, uh, that is now a lot easier than it was when I was a first mate on a charter boat and all we had was marine radios. Um, there wasn't a lot of networking going on. The networking went on at the taverns before and after the trips uh, back then. Now it goes on on the internet. Um, so it's, it's a lot easier now than it was then. Um, as far as good reliable intel um, that's how you locate fish when you only fish on the weekends it's impossible to know where the fish are going to be from day to day or uh, one weekend to the next without having a little bit of in information you need to know what the water's like out there you need to know what uh, what's changed uh, a couple things i suggest uh, whatever ports you go out of try to make friends with a few of the local charter captains uh, maybe go down there and 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 buy them a soda or uh or you know bring them a uh pack of venison meat or whatever you can do to, to sort of make friends with them uh, and try and get some, you know, get them to help you out with information from week to week. But I think, you know, use your local bait store uh, like ourselves or follow, you know, people like myself, uh, fishing reports and things like that. Uh, but also that now there's some of these Facebook pages, like I know there's one out of Port Washington that some of the guys are on a lot. Um, there's some other weekend warrior type uh, pages. And those pages are great because guys are going out after work. Guys work third shift. They're going out in the mornings and they're, and they're posting their reports uh, very regularly on there. Um, so that'll help you kind of understand what's happened with the lake. So really find a couple of things you can trust, sift through the BS and figure out you know, which guys on there are pretty, pretty honest and they're giving you the full report. They're telling you when they're not catching fish as much as they're telling you when they are catching fish. Because a lot of times the guys that aren't catching fish actually gave you better information than the guys that are because they, they told you where not to go. Um, those are a couple of key things I think that are important to, uh, to be able to be successful week in and week out for a weekend angler. Ed Hyman asks, number one bait for kings that are staging. Ed, that's a great question. Excuse me. I apologize. I've got uh, my allergies are horrible in the uh, in the summertime, so I want to make sure you can understand me. Uh, my number one bait for kings that are staging, really simple. That'd be a silver horde plug. Uh, size might depend from year to year. Color, of course, changes from day to day, year to year. But uh, a silver horde plug, J plug style plug, uh, is definitely my number one bait for staging kings. Great question. Brian Beard asks, how do you decide where to fish when you're leaving the pier, determining where to fish after a front or blow day or when the lake flips? Brian, that's a great question. And there was four or five questions very similar to this. You know, how does the weather impact? How does the wind impact? Uh, the first suggestion I can give you is get a good understanding of what each direction of wind does to the water outside of your port. I'm going to give you an example. So I've been fishing out of Sheboygan my entire life. I've fished in the entire Lake Michigan. I've also fished uh, Lake Ontario for salmon and trout. But I've fished out of Sheboygan a lot. I know every wind direction, what that does to the water. Uh, for example, a west wind cools our water off. A south wind warms our water up. A north wind warms our water up. An east wind warms our water up. But then we have a very unique animal here in Sheboygan that's almost unlike any other port. And that is a southeast wind here in Sheboygan cools our water off. It doesn't do that in Milwaukee necessarily. It doesn't do that in Racine necessarily or up in Sturgeon Bay. Matter of fact, I believe up in Sturgeon Bay, a southeast wind will warm their water up uh, quite a bit. Um, but for us, a southeast wind will cool our water off tremendously. And the main reason is, is because we have a deep hole in between us and Port Washington that I believe is about 900 feet deep. 
and it's on an angle that's just perfect with a true southeast wind. It blows that cold water out in front of Sheboygan. Um, and that's really important to know because I'll know, depending on which wind direction that the, the wind ripped out of, uh, the lake's going to change, and I likely will have an idea of how it changes. Now, one of the problems that we all incur when we get one of these or you know big winds for a couple of days is uh, we're... Most, most of us fishermen think we're pretty smart. Uh, a lot of times we are pretty smart, we're too smart. Um, the fish do not have the weather channel. The fish don't know that the wind's blowing out of the east. In other words, they wait until the lake actually changes for, to adapt to the water temperature. So what I find is a lot of times I make the move too fast. I'll go out the next morning after a big blow and realize that you know, the water has changed or it's starting to change, but the fish aren't where I thought they would be. And I'll be a little bit disappointed. I think, oh man, you know, I thought they'd be here for sure. Come to find out, 8, 12, 20 hours later, the fish are right there where I thought they were going to be. I was just there too fast. So do keep in mind that you need to give the fish a little bit of time to adapt and adjust to that change and get themselves to where, uh, you know, where the new water is or where the water they want to be in is. One thing I also found that really, uh, I really feel like uh, is important is each year is a little bit different. The fish tend to set up in a certain section of the water and a certain part of the water, a certain temperature in the water column. This year I feel like it's 44 to 46 degrees is where I have found most of my king action. Wherever you find that 44 to 46 degree water is close to the middle of the water column. I feel like that's where you're gonna find fish. Uh, you're gonna find kings for sure. Um, I feel like kings want to suspend. They don't want to be up real high on the surface because it's it's too spooky for them uh, if they can prefer it. And I don't think they want to be on the bottom necessarily because it's too hard for them to feed. I feel like they want to suspend about middle part of the the water column, but they also want to be comfortable in their water that they're comfortable in. So those are a couple of things that you can keep in mind. Uh, you know, the second part of this question, too, also goes to networking a little bit. If you can't get out there for a few days, but you know things change dramatically, see if you can figure out between some buddies of yours, our local charter captain, or maybe the local bait shop, what the water actually has done. And then you'll have a little bit better idea of, uh, of what you're dealing with. Matthew Clinton asks, you talk about warm water colors and cold water colors. Can you clarify when it comes to bait selection for salmon? Does it apply to spoons also or just flashers? That's a great question, Matt. I think it applies to everything, spoons, flashers, meat rigs, um, flies, and here's sort of my two cents on it. Cold water, uh, fish tend to prefer more natural looking baits. Uh, and what I mean by that is a lot of chrome flashers, a lot of blue really works well in cold water, uh, more natural looking stuff. Uh, then when the water gets really warm, I feel like the fish get a little bit more aggressive in their feeding patterns and they start to eat a little bit more gaudy stuff, not natural. So white blades, green blades, uh, glow in the dark stuff, uh, bright colors like a Wonder Bread type pattern, things like that really start working well uh, when the water gets warm. Those fish tend to get a little bit more aggressive. They're not maybe not uh, feeding as much naturally anymore as they are uh, just on instinct. Um, or their window of feeding is a lot shorter, as I mentioned earlier, because of that warm water. And they're a little bit more aggressive and they'll, they'll eat something that maybe doesn't look, doesn't look as natural as, as some of the other stuff. So uh, to clarify one more time, cold water colors, I prefer a lot of chrome stuff, shiny stuff with blue in it, uh, things like that. Um, I feel like more natural looking stuff, stuff that matches the bait fish a little bit closer. Uh, in the warm water, I like more gaudy stuff, whites, greens, glows, uh, things like that. Ben Carlson asks, could you go over some fall harbor fishing information, trolling, locations, depth lures, timing, uh, things like that? Great question, Ben. Uh, we're coming up on the fall harbor fishing. I think uh, you can always kind of look at Labor Day weekend as being a, a great time to harbor fish, uh, you know, in and in and out side of the harbor mouse for king salmon. Some years it starts a week or two before that. Some years it starts right around Labor Day. But generally, Labor Day weekend is, is always pretty good for that. Uh, for me, uh, silver horde plugs uh, are, are my favorite tool for around the harbor. I do catch fish on some crankbaits, things like bandits, deep junior thunder sticks, 
flicker minnows, stuff like that will work around the harbor area. And I also do catch some fish on spoons that time of year. Um, most of my action comes on plugs. I think those are the best. I like to use downriggers, uh, slide divers, and short lead cores, one color, two color, things like that, <clears throat> depending on the depth that I'm working. Uh, each harbor is a little bit different and some harbors have better returns than others. Uh, so you have to kind of get a feel for that. Sheboygan ha generally has a good return. Milwaukee has a great return. Um, I believe uh, Sturgeon Bay has a good return. They catch them pretty good up in the canal up there. Um, so check out those different areas uh, for a good fall return. This fall fishing, I think, is going to be fantastically fantastic for big fish. I don't know what the numbers are going to be like, but this is going to be your opportunity to put a 30-pounder on the wall if you haven't yet. Uh, they're going to congregate in a very small area. There's going to be thousands of big kings in that little small area when they turn on the bite everybody around you is going to be fighting to fish and it's going to be a great chance for you to catch a big one so i would get yourself loaded up with some with some uh silver horn plugs some crankbaits and get ready for that late august early september fall fishing action next question james keller asks explain the effects lake current has on the boat speed uh jim that's a great question uh, currents are are crazy. They're way crazier than we all imagine. Uh, we, we live and die by speed and temp probes now, like the fish hawk. I, had, I did a video on that the other day, and the guys that don't have one really have no idea how bad they're missing uh, great information. Like when I did the video the other day, the our speed over ground was 2.4, uh, our speed at the ball was 1.920. So there was a half mile an hour difference. That's actually not bad. That's kind of average, I would say. Uh, some days they're close, but um, most days I would say there's about a half mile an hour difference. Uh, there's days where you're going maybe three miles an hour, three and a half miles an hour on the surface, and you're only going two miles an hour at the ball. Or vice versa, a lot of times I'll see two miles an hour on the surface and three miles an hour on the ball. Well, it's no wonder you're not catching fish going one direction, or maybe not catching fish at all. Uh, so what you really get here is when you get a couple of days of wind um, out of the same direction, especially a heavy wind, you'll get a heavy current coming from that direction. So if we get some north wind, we'll get a heavy north current. Well, then what will happen is when you're going from north to south, you're going with the current and your lures are going to be ripping. Um, you know, they're going to be, uh, they're really going to be going. When you're going into the current, you're going to have a hard time getting your baits to really get going. Uh, so you need to adjust your speed to get that to get that to change. Um, you you almost have to have a speed and temp probe at this point, something that can tell you down where your lures are, uh, what your speed is, so that you can catch you know you can catch these fish. Uh, otherwise, there's just no way to really know what's going on down there. Great question, Jim. Brandon Bauer asks on your downriggers, how far back are you putting the bait behind the ball? It's a great question, Brandon. Uh, things have definitely changed in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, we are putting the leaders longer and longer and longer behind the downrigger ball. Uh, the fish are spooky. Uh, we all love to fish when the lake is calm. Unfortunately, that's a difficult time to catch fish uh, because they're spooky. So you need to get those baits away from the downrigger ball. I like to start at 50 foot behind the ball early in the morning. And then as the sun comes up, I usually adjust that to 75 or 100. And then there's some days if I'm gonna fish up in the top 60 foot of the water column, especially if I'm up in that 40 foot range or so, I might put that bait 150 feet behind the downrigger ball. It's basically a mini planer board at that point. Um, you know, I'm, I, I still have it behind the downrigger ball, obviously, but I have such a long lead on it, I've sort of taken that downrigger ball out of play as far as the spook factor goes. So I would say a range in between 50 and 150 feet and conditions will, will play a big role. If it's flat, calm, and sunny, going to extend that out to that 150 foot range if it's only uh, you know if it's cloudy foggy early morning or maybe real choppy i might keep that closer to like that 50 foot range kimberly fuller asks what else do you run j plugs on besides riggers what time of day do you run them on those rigs uh that's a great question kimberly it depends on if i'm fishing out in the lake or near the harbor but really i mean ideally i'll run them on sort of the same setups i guess uh, other than downriggers, I'll, I love to run plugs on boards. Uh, lead core, copper, they work on both. Uh, this is the time of year when plugs should start working out in the lake really well. Uh, you should be able to catch big kings on plugs right now. Um, and if the, if the fish are 
you know, 40 foot down in the water column, I'm going to put them on five colors, seven colors, 10 colors, things like that. If they're 50, 60, 70 feet down, I might put them on 200 coppers, 300 coppers. Um, I've also had good days with them on slide divers out in the lake, uh, mono slide divers, braid slide divers, uh, set a nice 50, 75 foot lead behind the slide diver and get that bait down 30, 40 feet. Um, I've had a lot of great days where I've caught some big kings on those. So that gives you a couple of different options other than downriggers to run your plugs. Uh, Josh Lehman asks, if you're working an east-west troll to find active fish in certain depths and catch a fish, do you then turn north and south to stay in that depth, or do you continue on your course? It's a great question, Josh. Um, there isn't a 100% a, a answer to that one. Uh, what, what you have to determine is, are you catching fish going east and west because of the current, and that's the best way to keep your rods straight? Or are you catching fish going east and west because, like you said, you're trying to locate fish? If I'm trying to locate fish and I get a double, let's say, in 180 on an east pass, I go out to 220 and I turn around, didn't get any more bites, come back in, and I get into 185 and get another fish, I then, then am going to start going north and south in that 180 to 185 range. Um, but if I set up in the morning in 100 foot and I get a bite in 120, I get a bite in 170, and I get a bite in 220, and now I turn around and come back west, and I get a bite in 210, I get a bite in 180, that tells me the fish are spread everywhere. I'm gonna then go east and west and just cover water. Um, especially if, like I said, going east and west allows my rods, based on the current, to look correct. So if the current is going from the east or to the east, uh, you know, it's going east and west, and my rods look the best that way, I love to troll east and west. I think it's a great way to fish for any species, including kings. But if the current is going out of the north or south, then east and west becomes a lot more difficult. It's hard to go that uh, direction, those directions, and I generally will only go those directions to search and then I will try to fish north and south as much as I can from there. Great question, Josh. Kyle Lee. Kyle Lee asks, matching flashes and flies to conditions, sunny, cloudy, dark, last light, first light, etc." Great question, Kyle. Um, I think this is a little bit over analyzed and what I mean by that is chrome flashers have taken over the fishery for the most part. Um, I would say 70% of the flashers that I put in the water at this point are chrome. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of days or there's some days where white blades or green blades will outperform chrome, but 70% of the flashers that I put in the water now are chrome. So, you know, I'm going to use chrome flashers with UV tape on them or shiny tape on them uh, a lot of times. but uh, if, if it's a real foggy day or real dark, I'm at, out at first light or I'm staying out till dark, I a lot of times will take off a few of those chrome blades and put a white blade or a green blade with some glow tape on it. Um, or even those new Pro Troll lighted flashers, uh, a lot of guys have been having success with um, in low light situations or real, real dark, hazy days. Again, one of the things I also mentioned before was I think time of year plays a little bit of role into that. Early in the season, June, July, I, I like a lot of chrome and blue, chrome and green, stuff like that. Uh, but as you get into towards the fall, like now, when those fish start to turn colors, uh, they're a little bit further along in their maturation process. They act a little bit differently than they do the rest of their entire life cycle. They now seem to pick out some more gaudy stuff uh, things like Wonder Bread is just a great example of a pattern that I wouldn't use in June and have very much success with. But in August, uh, out in the lake and or in September around the harbor, Wonder Bread's one of my favorite patterns. And it seems like those big adult kings really like that, that gaudy stuff. So this is the time of year where I'll start to put more of those white two-faced flashers out, um, green blades with big green dots on them like Marv's Big Fatty or, or green and black dots or whatever. Uh, those are the type of blades that I, I definitely will start going to on a daily basis now this time of year and I'll start adding those to a mix of my chrome flashers. Great question Kyle. Jeremiah John is going to wrap up the last question here. I sure appreciate everybody uh, tuning into this. Uh, try to keep it somewhat reasonable on time here. It's getting a little long, so if you if you did watch the whole thing, I, I sure appreciate it. I hope it helps you all. Jeremiah John asks, how, how long of a leader for your lead core? So all of my lead core and copper rigs, weighted steel rigs, uh, are all the same. I use a 50-foot mono leader. I talk about this a lot to customers that walk in the store every day. I, I really suggest that you use mono for all of your leaders on all of your setups. So for your lead core, your copper, your weighted steel, um, your pump handles, your 
behind your dipsies, always use mono. You want that stretch. Almost everything we're using now today for setups is no stretch line except for downriggers. Um, so if you go ahead and you put fluorocarbon on there, you're now added another no stretch line to a no stretch setup. And you're just asking for snap offs with these giant fish. So use mono. Um, and for my lead core and copper and weighted steel setups, I'm using a 50 foot leader. Uh, generally, I like 25 pound test. This time of year, I might bump it up to 30 pound test because these fish are huge. They're screaming tons of line out and they're breaking off a ton of stuff. So uh, good luck fishing this weekend. We got the Sheboygan Coho Derby going on. Uh, we got lots of lots of people fishing up and down the Wisconsin shoreline, and we got a lot left. Uh, seems like it's the end of the year. It's kind of getting somber. It's like, ah, oh, summer's coming to an end. Kids are going to go back to school soon. But we still got one third of summer here yet, uh, and, and I think we got some of the best big king fishing coming up uh, here in August and early September. So get out there and good luck. Hope you enjoy this video.